Oh, hello there. Uh, my name is Jeff Bruce, and I'm president of Jeffrey L. Bruce and Company. Uh, we're a landscape architecture firm, and you're in Kansas City today. Didn't know you'd make the trip so early, but uh, we're glad you're here, and it gives us a little bit of an opportunity to chat and and talk about, uh, I think, an important subject, which is integrated water management and uh, net zero water, uh, sort of the frontier of green infrastructure, and I think a very important issue coming into the future here. So um, I'm going to work back and forth between the uh, slideshow and uh, chat with you. So uh, let's begin to chat. So uh, this is uh, typically uh, the very complex diagram I use to explain what I'm talking about, uh, primarily with public officials. And the public themselves uh, really have a limited understanding of water. Uh, I understand it rains somewhere in the world and somewhere out of a faucet that water comes, but the interrelationship of that is uh, a lot of times a mystery and uh, can't really be determined uh, by the public. So let's delve into the opportunity to look at water in a little bit different uh, time frame and a little bit different mode. I do like to uh, start talking typically with an Edward Abbey quote, which water, 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 there is no shortage of water in the desert unless you try to establish a city where no shit city should be. And what that tells me is that um, basically water is in relationship to the environment. There's a balance between uh, how nature uses water and uh, the water itself have created this equity, this relationship that uh, tends to create a balance. And man, once they inner uh, sort of place themselves in these environments, uh, we sort of disrupt the water cycle and it gives us uh, a bit of an issue in terms of uh, now trying to manage water in a much different sort of circumstance in regards to that. So, one of my favorite sayings is from Teddy Roosevelt in 1910, I believe it was, where he said a civilized people should be able to dispose of their sewage in a better way than putting it in their drinking water. No, well, that's now been about 103 years and we haven't begun to solve or begun to solve that sort of equation in terms of uh, utilizing a resource uh, for disposal of waste in our uh, society and within our cities. Um, as we look uh, sort of across the world, um, what we find is North America, this is a graph of uh, water use. Uh, by country, and what we find is uh, in North America, both uh, Canada and the United States per capita have one of the highest water uses um, in the world. Uh, the annual American withdrawal is close to half a million gallons per year per person, which is about three times the local withdrawal rate. I was uh, sort of struck by Ubekistan's uh, consumption outly, outpacing ours and had to do a little inquiry to find out what that was, but we, we seem to find that Ubekistan has agricultural practices that may not be quite as sustainable so that uh, their water consumption is much higher than it should be in, in a region such as that. I think what we can all aspire to is looking at getting to the global average or getting to a very, very high efficiency, sort of like uh, the United Kingdom in terms of their water use. As I sort of project water into the future, I can see that uh, water restrictions, particularly for use in green infrastructure, 
and for use in uh, the landscape um, is under increasing restrictions. We're seeing uh, more and more uh, prohibition of uh, use of potable water and it's I think a real concern in terms of this uh, from a landscape you know I'm projecting we're somewhere between level three and level four and certainly uh, we don't want to get to level six where we're totally restricted from using water as a way to fuel our green infrastructure in regards to uh, making it work and getting all of the ecological benefits out of it that we can. Um, so let's uh, begin a bit of a topic here. Um, when we look at water in the urban footprint, there's a number of things that are core ideas that I think are useful and beneficial to understand. Uh, one, our cities can be much more sustaining, much more renewable. Um, we look at the urban footprint and there are enormous amounts and volumes of water that go unaccounted for that we can reclaim and utilize uh, certainly within a urban context. There are numerous ways to recapture and reuse water in the urban uh, footprint. And when we do, we will save money, we'll save energy, we'll save other costs. Um, most importantly, I think there's an opportunity to learn from living systems, uh, plant ecologies and, and uh, living plants have mechanisms that will help us use water wisely. Uh, Mother Nature's been doing it for a far longer time than we have, so uh, I think there are things that we can certainly uh, learn from her example in terms of the wise use of water and water resources. Uh, in going through the integrated uh, water management series that we developed for the American Society of Landscape Architects and Green Roofs for Healthy Cities, uh, we developed an entire series of um, definitions and sort of collected them and what we found is there in a, is an enormous amount of uh, uh, definitions for different types of water. Blue water, green water, gray water, black water, sea water, salt water, ground water. Uh, and as a result, uh, instead of trying to create a, another terminology, we thought we'd look for the most aggressive and the most forward-thinking uh, concept about water, and that was really uh, came out of the living building challenge, uh, which was the concept of net zero water. And net zero water is really the idea that through a combination of rainfall harvesting and aggressive conservation and water recycling, that buildings and sites can be self-sufficient and remove themselves actually from the water infrastructure or the water grid. Um, this has really been a, a basis, I think, of an aspiration that, in fact, will take us quite a while to... Uh, uh, actually achieve because uh, it is rather difficult. We'll see that uh, in certain parts of the world, um, like the Empire State Building, it may be very difficult to become self-sufficient. I'm not sure there's enough rainfall that lands on that roof to supply the tens of thousands of people uh, that occupy that space adequate uh, drinking water, but I think we can begin to uh, implement these technologies within larger sites and within building settings where we can begin to achieve such uh, sort of net zero opportunities. There's a number of reasons that I think net zero is being driven in terms of the public perception. Um, one is our increasing scarcity and limits to uh, access to water. Um, you know, a number of the new building codes are restricting potable use of water for a number of different requirements. Another factor I think in, is important is the cost of water and wa wastewater treatment. 
particularly in the United States with the Environmental Protection Agency setting guidelines for the Clean Water Act, uh, we're going to see rather dramatic increases in water use and water consumption um, and also the cost of that based on a growing population. Um, the other thing that I think is beginning to uh, work into the equation is the regulatory mandates to control stormwater on site. And again, this is part of the EPA, but we're seeing now the investment of a certain volume of resource in order to meet regulatory compliance. And uh, in so far as net water, I think it becomes an opportunity to sort of leverage uh, those investments and look at them not specifically for stormwater, but to have a bro more broad context and look at them for integrated water. Uh, it's interesting, uh, stormwater BMPs or best management practices are only utilized about 3 to 5 percent of the year when it actually rains fairly heavily. And as a result, we're creating sort of a living machine that has us uh, some additional opportunity to come back and utilize that machine for other water for uh, 95 to 97 percent of the time and I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, water quality is going to be more and more an issue uh, when we look at our uh, environment and uh, the EPA again in the United States regulates about 91 chemicals uh, it's estimated that there are over 60,000 chemicals in today's manufacturing process. So we're only looking at a very small percentage of the chemicals that actually hit the water stream and are returned to us through processing. So it may be a very short period of time before the water we harvest off of the roof uh, may be of higher quality than what can be delivered to us by the water utility. So I think it is incumbent on us to take a little bit closer look at some of these things. Uh, climate change is also going to have an impact in terms of water availability and um, we can see that in the snowpack in California. Uh, diminishing snowpack which is the primary source of water for most of California's coast. And uh, these changing patterns and more intensity of patterns uh, may in fact create situations where water rich uh, environments will change and be not quite as water rich. So there's a number of things that are occurring uh, within this uh, space and I think there's a real opportunity to look at it a little bit differently. Um, we'll put up sort of a, uh, a view of, well, let me see sort of put up a view of some of the concepts, I think, of uh, net zero water that make it uh, advantageous to look at. Uh, certainly is whatever water we harvest is free and only the cost of our collection and treatment and storage. Uh, so for the most part, in most parts of the uh, North America, that's the case. Um, when we harvest water too uh, close to its source, we're eliminating this need for a very long and costly cost uh, distribution system for the water. Uh, typically water will fall at the end of the watershed and travel through the entire watershed where it's captured and cleaned and then pumped all the way back to the top of it uh, for our use. Uh, if we look at harvesting water for landscape in process, we also uh, supply and replenish groundwater we can reduce stormwater flows, which increases capacity within our uh, cities for higher density and development, I think is important. And uh, it helps uh, reduce utility peak demands and uh, reduces or delays the expansion of existing water treatment water systems. And ultimately, I think uh, with water harvesting, uh, we can ultimately reduce our um, utility bills and achieve a, a sort of a sustainable and resilient type of system using this approach and technology. 
in order to sort of categorize this uh, very large and potentially complex area, uh, water is pretty ubiquitous. It covers uh, most of the world and uh, is integrated as the world's greatest solvent. And uh, so as a result, it can get complicated pretty quickly. So what we've tried to do is simplify the concept of net water zero into a water cycle. And the idea is that net zero water can actually harvest the power of nature to restore our rain, air, and groundwater. So it's, um, uh, we just can't simply build greener cities by wasting less energy and water. We need to look at it in, in a different manner. So when we're looking at integrated water, um, really what we're looking at is the seven steps in which uh, ultimately we go through a cycle and loop these uh, water back into the original harvest. So we harvest water. Uh, there is some pretreatment in order to get it to storage. That's called conveyance. Once it's in storage, the pretreatment sort of stabilizes the water so that we can use it in the future and reduces the, uh, the treatment required for use. When we pull it out of storage, there is some treatment for the intended use. We distribute it where it needs to go and then use it. Any excess from the usage should then be directed back into harvest and back into the cycle. Now this gives us a, a sort of a clear understanding of what we can do and how we can circumvent uh, sort of the linear use of water. Now this particular slide uh, on the left hand side uh, shows our traditional use of water. So you can see we take water from a receiving body uh, we process it and we distribute it either to the city or to ag or to the suburbs for use. Once you're done with the water, it is then uh, transported to a municipality uh, for cleanup. And once it's cleaned, uh, it's then discharged typically to the same receiving body that we got it in the first place. So as you can see, it's a pretty linear process, uh, not a lot of efficiency in that process. If we look at the net zero approach on the right-hand side, uh, we can really see we're creating sort of smaller loops where that water is redirected and reused as many times as we can uh, in terms of a particular use or a particular site thereby reducing the linear nature of water and creating these little uh, integrated net zero loops. So the idea of that is uh, if we get efficient at this, it's pretty obvious that we can save energy and we can save water, we can save resources, and we can limit the amount of water uh, sort of removed from or placed back into our receiving bodies. And I think this is a actually a pretty important concept about uh, how we might look at water in the future and uh, try to, as we would say, decentralize the use of water itself. So <clears throat> took us quite a while to uh, sort of try to provide an understanding of this that would help us sort of communicate it. And I thought about it for a while and, and uh, started to try to under, understand a simple uh, analogy that everyone could, uh, uh, could relate to and, and sort of grasp the concept. And really what I thought of was that hydrologic cycle that we all learned about in uh, grade school and grammar school, this uh, idea that uh, water would be evaporated from the seas and be travel in clouds and hit the mountain and be condensated into rainfall and would travel down the mountain in streams and then go into the ground and become groundwater and um, that whole concept. Well, what we tried to do was uh, 
create that same hydrologic cycle for a building and a site, assuming that uh, water moved in a lot of different mechanisms in these uh, cycles, similar to the hydraulic cycle. So if you can imagine, and uh, we may not have been as uh, clear or as simple as that original uh, third grade sort of diagram, but you can begin to understand that water has uh, that same sort of looping and integrated pattern even on a building and in and out of the building it's sort of a very permeable relationship as we get to get to water and its relationship uh, with net zero and the opportunities that that provides. I've done a fair amount of talking about water in general but uh, what we tend to find is that um, water very click quickly becomes classified. The second water touches something, uh, whether it touches the roof of your building or the parking lot of your site or the sink that you have in your bathroom, it becomes classified and categorized. And all of a sudden, a bunch of uh, regulations and requirements and restrictions sort of glom onto that water pretty quickly. And in Net Zero we tried to break that down but we needed to look at really those sources for harvesting water and what they might be. So uh, to further define those opportunities we can look at, uh, obviously we can look at rainwater which is water that hits a impervious surface typically above the ground and runs off. Uh, we can look at stormwater which hits either parking lots or landscapes, anything on the ground. An interesting water that a lot of people don't think about is foundation drain water or sump water. And most buildings and homes have a sump pump in their basement that removes excess groundwater so that the water pressure doesn't uh, damage the foundation. And typically this is just discarded, but it ends up being uh, possibly a very viable use, a source of water and uh, a fairly high volume use of water. Uh, we can look at gray water, which is a water defined as not being contaminated by human waste. So this can be uh, water from sinks or showers or washing machines, uh, a number of different uh, uh, non-waste contaminated water uses. Uh, and it typically represents about 80% uh, of water coming out of your residence. Uh, black water is uh, water from toilets and primarily urinals. And uh, this is <coughs> Uh, probably the water with the highest health concern because it has the potential to transmit uh, sort of disease and viruses and uh, parasites. So uh, what we find in water harvesting a lot of times if there isn't a, a good basis for understanding how to manage that water typically reflects to the most restrictive and the least or the most costly treatment available around, which would be black water. Um, so uh, we wanted to include that because there is a, a great need in our urban footprint uh, to restore nutrient recycling. Uh, we've disrupted uh, our ecology or urban ecology the way that we recycle nutrients. So this would be a great opportunity to recapture nutrients that would be fertilizers for continued growth of plant material in the process. <clears throat> so those are sort of natural uh, waters that we can look at. We can also look at an entire range of process water uh, which comes from equipment and machinery which includes uh, air conditioning condensate, which is a, uh, uh, it's almost distilled water, so it's a very high quality. Cooling tower blowdown water or reject water. Uh, reverse osmosis reject water. Uh, 
as they clean water and filter water through RO systems or reverse osmosis systems, there's a fair amount of water that is rejected out of that. And we can also actually look at swimming pool uh, backwash and, and uh, other water sources. Maybe not as uh, great a volume, but also uh, sort of a significant amount that we could actually utilize. This particular graphic was uh, one of the more interesting that I saw, and it helps us explain how each building's water print or uh, fingerprint is actually quite different depending on use. So this uh, indicates uh, five different types of buildings and then each of the colors related on that graph is a different type of alternative water or water use. So what that really tells me is that uh, water uh, and net zero and looking at the attempt of trying to achieve net zero water in this uh, sort of context uh, really makes it a custom sort of design that you need to look at each building uh, individually and uniquely and sort of figure out the availability of those waters and when they're going to be and what they might actually um, uh, be suitable for harvesting. Uh, you look at a number of different uh, aspects to these waters and uh, even though this chart seems very static, what we tend to find out is that the water um, in fact will vary from time and place uh, and also in water quality. So for example, if we've got a uh, college dormitory, uh, you would anticipate a lot of gray water and black water uh, from the showers and the bathrooms going through that. Uh, but you need to understand and consider that during the summer months when the students are there, your water profile changes. So the availability of that water would be uh, much different and uh, needs to be taken into account in uh, order to understand um, uh, how we can balance our uses. What's important to understand is that uh, each of these waters have actually a, um, a water quality issue to them. Uh, even rainwater uh, picks up contaminants and has uh, concerns uh, that need to be considered and looked at. So when we look at water quality, particularly for water harvest and reuse, uh, we can break it down into basically three categories of contaminants that we're concerned with. Uh, sediment, which is total suspended solids, uh, small particles floating in water, uh, total dissolved solids, which are like salts and other materials that actually dissolve in, in water. Uh, sort of like if you took sugar, dumped it into a warm glass of water and stirred it, eventually it would be a dissolved solid. Uh, turbility is really a measure of the clarity of the water, how much you can see through it. Uh, and this it gives us some indication of the type of treatment methods that are going to be required. Hardness, which is sodium, electrical conductivity, and pH are considerations. Uh, the, you need to meet certain requirements, particularly for plant growth. And then nutrient levels, whether it's biologically, uh, biological oxygen demand, how much organic is in there, nitrogen, phosphorus, phosphate. And uh, the nutrients are really what fuels pathogens and the potential for health concerns. Uh, when we start to look at those in terms of water quality. Uh, once we harvest water, there is an entire uh, range of uh, uses we can have. And what we wanted to do in an ideal world was to consider all of those uses uh, as an opportunity to recycle or reuse the water that we're harvesting. 
So we can look at potable uses, which is drinking water, cooking, bath water, dishwashing water. Uh, indoor non-potable uses uh, don't quite have the same uh, treatment requirements. We can use it for cooling towers and cleaning, industrial processing, laundries possibly, and uh, toilet flushing. And then really what uh, a vast majority of outdoor uses are currently being used by uh, potable water, which would certainly be a good uh, alternative water would be a very good substitution for uh, <coughs> the restriction of uh, potable water and substitution alternative water for outdoor use. This can be fire suppression, landscape irrigation, pond filling, building washer ther thermal conditioning, evaporative cooling, food production, water features, dust control, street sweeping, aquifer recharge. And what's really interesting in water reuse is uh, there's pretty good defined requirements for treatment for uh, indoor potable and indoor non-potable use. Uh, outdoor uses uh, haven't really defined much their uh, water quality relationships, but intuitively I think we understand that there could be uh, very much different water quality needs for each of these uses. I'm not sure that fire suppression uh, needs the same water treatment as food production. I would anticipate food production needing a higher water quality so we're not transmitting heavy metals and other things that the plants that and the vegetables we would uh, grow and eat would absorb these and um, uh, enter into our food stream but fire suppression may be a totally different water quality that we could use. So really the idea is as we're looking at water uh, what we really have to do is begin to match the source of the water and its quality level with the intended use. And this is sort of the tricky aspect of getting net zero to work, is determining the amount of water we can harvest and when we can harvest it, understanding the water requirements of how much water we need in the use and the water requirement of that use. So we've got this water quality versus minimal acceptable quality where we're trying to match up these two types of um, the harvested water and the minimum water quality we need. Scheduling is really an important aspect. Um, it would be great if we harvested water uh, exactly at the moment when we needed it. But a lot of times that doesn't occur. Uh, for landscape use, we don't really need to run the irrigation system when it's raining out or shortly after it's rained. So the scheduling of when we need the water and when it's available ends up really being the question about how much storage is required. And storage ends up being uh, really the single most expensive component of a rainwater harvesting system. So if we can better manage when water is harvested and when we actually use it for demand, it's going to make it uh, uh, less costly in terms of the amount of storage that's required. Again, this has lots of seasonal considerations uh, that need to be taken into account. And then the thing that we have to understand is that uh, currently there's a lot of restriction regulatorily on how you use and how you harvest and how you store your water. Uh, understanding that climate, cost, types of water are all going to change uh, dramatically within different regions and it's something that we uh, really be, should begin to uh, try to consider a regional approach to some of these sort of concerns. So uh, basically in closing there's some uh, some ideas, uh, some sort of directions that I think uh, are going to be important for us to 
understand water in the future and, and some trends that I think are going to be important that we uh, consider and try to understand how to plug ourselves into. If you look at water use currently, uh, most of the nation's water and even in North America is used by agriculture. And a lot of those systems maybe aren't as efficient as they need to be. But uh, the growing population primarily are in urban centers. So at some point in time, there's got to be a bit of a shift uh, from agricultural use to urban use for some of this water. Um, you can see the politics of it playing out quite easily. Uh, rural areas are very sparsely populated and urban areas are heavily populated. So if it goes to a vote, you know probably what the vote's going to go. But I think it's incumbent on us to consider looking at reallocation of water resources from urban uses to urban uses <clears throat> in such a way that they are both sustainable and they both benefit. And I think there's lots of opportunities to do that. We need just to be cognizant of how we can do that and sustain urban or uh, rural agriculture at the same time as creating demand. The other thing that I think's occurring that's going to be uh, fairly important is this concept of decentralizing water distribution and treatment. Our piping system uh, within most of the urban cities are pretty antiquated. They may have been there 100 years, 150 years, and they're falling apart. Replacement and upgrading of this infrastructure is a tremendous cost. So the idea of us going back and <coughs> actually rebuilding this, uh, we might consider decentralization of uh, water distribution and water treatment in such a fashion that we don't have these extremely long and complicated distribution runs. So I think um, uh, certainly when we look at net zero harvesting and get buildings to be more self-sufficient, we're certainly diminishing our need on a long centralized distribution system. The most difficult thing I think we're going to uh, run across is really the regulatory uh, barriers to uh, this entire concept that I've presented, which is water uh, crossing these types of uh, classifications and being reclassified and reused in different ways. Uh, right now, it's uh, uh, the regulatory environment is, is sort of a confusing sort of series of hurdles that we have to overcome uh, not only in the permit process but I think even more broadly within our code process. Uh, if you're using water uh, that falls on your roof that and you're using it inside, a lot of times it falls to the Department of Health to tell you how and what you can do with that if by chance you allow that water to escape the house and trickle outside, you then fall under the regulatory environment a lot of times of the Department of Environment. So uh, breaking down and removing the silos for using alternative water, waters across these uh, classifications uh, probably is one of the more important aspects of what we need to do in terms to achieve net zero in the future. Then finally, it's a uh, bit of my uh, projection of the future, but it's really looking at integrated green infrastructure. Uh, we're starting to see some regulatory requirements for that in stormwater. Uh, I can project out into the future and really anticipate that this may be the next utility. Integrated green infrastructure where we look at water in a much more comprehensive fashion. We take the water from rainfall, capture it on the roof, grow food on it, trickle it down the green walls, 
clean it at the bottom of the site in stormwater BMPs or bioswales and wetlands, allow it to enter into the street system through green streets and water the trees and plants there, uh, allow it to be evaporated through the vegetation to help reduce our urban heat island effects, and then really uh, trickle it into the groundwater in such a way that we really integrate ourselves into this uh, entire sort of hydrological cycle so that we don't uh, provide barriers and mismanage water as we currently are within uh, sort of our footprint, urban footprint. So that's part of a, uh, a dream I have in terms of uh, where we might go in the future and how to position ourselves with water uh, as we sort of make decisions uh, on into the future itself. Uh, appreciate you coming to Kansas City uh, today. Uh, I hope I've given you a little bit different way to think about water and uh, maybe giving you some ideas in terms of uh, uh, the next time we get to utilize or design something within the city, uh, maybe net zero might come up as a part of a way. It doesn't have to be complicated. We can implement this in uh, a number of different simple ways, and I think it would be beneficial for all of us to consider it. Thanks again for stopping by. Uh, look forward to uh, uh, meeting you at the next location, and uh, hopefully until then, uh, we hope you have uh, wise use of our water. Thanks again.